What's up, everyone? Welcome back to the State of the Arc podcast. My name is Mike. My name is Kason. And we have a special guest with us today, TJ, from the YouTube channel TJ the Emperor. If you have not heard of this YouTube channel, you've got to go look it up. I (laughs) was shocked. Frankly, I was shocked when I was watching TJ's uh, videos on Xenosaga. He has a whole three-part Xenosaga retrospective. Um, on all three Xenosaga games. And I was watching this and I was just like, this is amazing. Like, this is truly, really, really good. How have more people not been sharing this on Reddit and talking about this video? It's fantastic. I recommend it to everybody, but I wanted to pass it to TJ real quick. Tell me a little bit about what inspired you to make three hour plus long videos on Xenosaga. <laughs> and, uh, and, you know, where does your passion for the Xeno series come from? Yeah, well, first of all, let me just say thank you for uh, inviting me uh, on your show. I've been a fan of you guys for years, and I never expected you to... When I saw that you had le- left that comment on one of my Xenosaga videos, I'm like, oh my god, Rick, like, it's, <laughs> those, it's those guys, they, they saw my video. Um, but yeah, um, yeah, I guess what made me want to do this massive, like, altogether like three and a half hours worth of uh, videos on xenosaga the entire series um i've been a fan of these games since basically since very shortly after the uh the original one came out in 2003 i was like 13 and um i talk about this and actually i think the first video i did i remember reading i think it was in game informer magazine they had like and this was probably a couple months before the first game came out uh, just this big two-page like preview on the game, and yeah, I had already been a fan of uh, role-playing games at the time, so I was reading about it, and you know, it just the graphics, you know, for the time, you know, for the early two thousands, they looked incredible. I've always been a fan of sci-fi, so seeing like a big like epic sci-fi RPG like this, this was you know, as a thirteen-year-old kid, this was new for me. So and you did, you had not played Xenogears. I, I did not. Um, I was okay. aware of Xenogears. I knew it existed. Um, but I remember there was a, I, I was reading an issue of, of Game Pro at the time, back when Xenogears came out, and they gave it a really bad review. Oh, really? <laughs> oh, really? Yeah. And, and like yeah. reading that review back, like all these years later, it was obvious. It was one of those, like the guy who was playing a game got like only a couple hours in and uh-huh. like gave up. And it was a bad review. And like yeah. back then I, I was kind of like, I base, you know, I would base whether or not to play games based on those reviews. So I'm oh, like, totally. eh, I, yeah. I guess I don't need to play this. And then, uh, and then once I played Xenosaga and, you know, completely fell in love with it. And I went back and I'm like, huh, maybe the Xenogears thing is actually pretty cool after all. <laughs> so then I went out, went and, uh, you know, s- seeked it out. And this was like before you could get it. This was before emulation was really a thing. Like the only okay, way you sure. could play it, this was like the only way you could play it was to spend like $100 on a used copy. Um, but I managed to get one. And yeah, so that's a, nice. that's how I got into Xeno Saga and by extension, <laughs> Xeno Gears. <laughs> and so your experience with Xeno Saga episode one must have been pretty excellent then i know that you had you know your, your expectations for two were <laughs> dashed they a little bit die high and they were <laughs> destroyed <laughs> they were completely oh man destroyed. but yeah but yeah my get it going into xenosaga episode one my expectations like they weren't super high like it looked like a cool game and that's kind of as much as i was expecting but xenosaga is it's one of those things that like I described it as like, it's a game that feels like it was made like Tetsuya Takahashi made a game specifically for me. <laughs> Cause it's all these oh, things okay. that I like, like, you know, I'm, I like RPGs, obviously I'm into, I'm into sci-fi, all the like religious, you know, philosophical references. Like even back when I was younger, I didn't really know as much about that at the time, but it was really something right. I was interested in. Cool. And like, I've been an anime fan for a really long time. And he, you know, Takahashi has drawn a lot from, from, you know, the anime traditions and 
in his games. So it was all these things like kind of coming together as one. And it's like, like I said, it felt like you made the game for me. <laughs> yeah. nice. So, so from that, yeah, I just completely fell in love with it from like the first time I played it. Well, it's, it's funny because I've played every Xeno game aside from the sagas. <laughs> yeah, I feel like that's yeah. pretty common, I yeah. think. Yeah. Just because they're so hard to, like, they're so inaccessible now. Yeah, I'm right. Like, if you don't have a PS2 or you can't emulate PS2 games, you kind of, you just, you can't play them. Right. They're not yeah. accessible. Yeah. They're not. Like, you can still get, like, Xeno Gears and all the Xenoblade games digitally, but Xeno Saga, you just, it's nothing. There's nothing. Yeah, it really sucks. I wish Namco would do something about that, but. Yeah, a lot of people do. <laughs> yeah. Well, even even just, well, <clears throat> I guess I'm getting ahead of myself a little bit here. Mm-hmm. I did not know this until uh, recently, but there was a DS version of this game, oh, of these yeah. games released of episode there, one and two. There was. Um, um, yeah, but it not in the West. And right. uh, even like a fan translation has not really, or emulating it, I don't know. It's, yeah, it's, it's been very accessible here in the West. Even like yeah. a simplified version like that there's there's never been a fan translation there hasn't even been like there's been like translations of bits and pieces of some of the dialogue but like it's not like something that a non-native japanese speaker could read which is so disappointing for me yeah i because i I, really like that style yeah from from what i understand there was a fan translation in the works at some point but it hasn't been updated in like seven or eight years or something yeah, i just looked into it yeah <laughs> and that is correct and it is disappointing but at the same time i mean psh, i'm not doing it <laughs> yeah i mean i can imagine how the insanely difficult it must be to translate a game oh, like yeah. that so especially oh, yeah. for a fan translator like yeah. well hearing from the translator of xenogears mm-hmm. what was his name mike i can't remember his richard name richard honeywood richard yeah. honeywood yeah, yeah man that was that was just that was so yeah. difficult. I, I think he did a great job yeah. considering considering he had to do the entire thing basically whole, by himself. Yes, and they were referencing like these obscure like philosophical like ideas. Yeah, that, I don't know. I, I it seemed to me like Richard really needed to like do research into what they were even talking about in order to actually translate the game correctly. Oh, for sure. Yeah, yeah. which yeah. is wild. So I yeah. don't blame anyone who doesn't want to translate Xenosaga. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> So yeah, uh, let's we'll get into the the DS version of the game here. Yeah, we're getting ahead of ourselves. We certainly are. Yes, it is, <laughs> it is the it's the version of the game I wish I could have played as my. I know. As well. Yeah, um, me too. So this is going to be an interesting experience, and this is where I, I probably need to to take a step back for a second. So mm-hmm. for anybody who is joining this podcast for the first time, you haven't seen our Xeno Gears podcast or any of our other games that we've covered. Um, The way that we treat this is a little bit like a book club. So um, typically, one or the other of us, Kason and I, who co-host the show, will have played the game before. The other one maybe hasn't played the game before. And so we try not to spoil events before they happen. Um, Now, this does make it to where there are going to be times where something will occur, which there's a lot of talking points about early on in the game, if you know where it's going where we will pass over that for the time being and not yeah. discuss it yet because we want to get to the big reveal first, then go back and see see how this is connected. Um, this is primarily a storytelling analysis podcast. Yeah. Um, so we break down the techniques of storytelling um, and, and the stories of video games. We will touch on gameplay from time to time, particularly when it uh, sort of like aids the storytelling when it's sort of playing into telling the story um and we will touch on lore but this is by no means a lore centric podcast we're not trying to like break down everything in the xeno saga universe on here uh, we're, we're no. talking about thematic content what's the core of this game getting at what's the story about how do they accomplish telling that message through their characters dialogue events and so forth so that's what you uh which you would expect from our podcast. And that having been said, neither of us, Kason or I, have played these Xenosaga games before. This is the first time that we will have done Ooh. a game where neither of us have played it. 
I know. I, I, was, yeah. I was always really worried to try that because I don't feel like you can do a proper analysis if you haven't at least seen or played the thing once before. But perhaps we will have TJ come on again sporadically throughout the series mm-hmm. when he's available, when our schedules line up. And uh, he can kind of be that guide for us the way that I was a guide for Kaysen on Xenogears and uh, can kind of, uh, you know, smirk and smile as we try to guess at what's going on. Um, <laughs> oh, goodness. <laughs> so, anyways, right. that's so, so stay away from too many spoilers in the comments. That being said, we can't control that and we're not going to, like, you know, delete people's comments. Yeah, so we don't do that. If you're worried about spoilers, if you're like us, you have not played the game before, this is going to be your first time as well. Don't read the comments. There are always spoilers posted, posted in the comments on our videos, even though we ask people not to. So there, there you go. That's the preamble. That's out of the way now. So let's dive into uh, Xenosaga. I think, <clears throat> I think it's a stretch to assume that anyone who's going to watch us has seen the Xenogears podcast, <laughs> uh, yeah. particularly even just the first episode where we do a whole retrospective on the development of that game. So I want to first briefly, I mean, if you want the full thing, go watch our episode one of the Xenogears podcast. I want to briefly talk a little bit about Tetsuya Takahashi and his wife, Kaori Tanaka, who created this whole Xenoverse um, and kind of how it got started with Xenogears, because that context is really necessary to understand how Xenosaga evolved from. Them. So uh, Tetsuya Takahashi and Kaori Tanaka uh, were developers at Squaresoft, right kind of as the Final Fantasy series was really peaking on the Super Nintendo. Um, with Final Fantasies 4, 5, and 6, and particularly yeah. in 6, uh, Tets- Tetsuya Takahashi was, was heavily involved with the graphics and mm-hmm. the art on that the, one. The Magitek armor, mm-hmm. specifically. Yep. Because he he's all about those mechs. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> the intro with the walking and the, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, it's a, there's a really funny interview. It's an Iwata asks uh, when mm-hmm. uh, Xenoblade and uh, the last story were coming out. They were interviewing uh, Tetsu Takashi and Hironobu Sakaguchi about those games. And mm-hmm. Sakaguchi talks about how you know he had a, an idea in his mind about what he wanted those mechs to look like. It, you know, obviously the key art of the Magitek armor is very different than the one you see in the game. The actual sprites, um, right. right? And so. He talks about how Takashi kind of just did what he wanted to do instead of what he was asked to do. And, yeah. And Hironobu Sakaguchi had to admit, like, oh, but yours is better than what I had in mind. So, like, you know, yeah. <laughs> it is what it is. That's awesome. Oh, Great job. So, te- I-, I say that uh, because Tetsuya Takahashi has always been kind of this headstrong, um, very passionate auteur type of creator where. He wants to take ownership, mm-hmm. complete ownership of, of what he wants to do and mm-hmm. do it the way he wants. <laughs> yes. Um, and he's, he's had a lot of, uh, well, at least at Square, he, he had um, a lot of, uh, he, he, he struggled there in that environment. He, he really wanted freedom to do it his way. Um, mm-hmm. And this sort of led to his exit from Square and the formation of Monolith mm-hmm. Soft later. Um, mm-hmm. But recognizing how passionate Takahashi was about working on a project that was not just Final Fantasy over and over and over again, Hironobu Sakaguchi really went to bat for him and allowed him to make his own IP. Now, originally, Xeno Xeno Gears, which is a Squaresoft PlayStation RPG, was pitched as um, a a possible story to be used for Final Fantasy VII. Yeah, and yeah, written by Kaori Tanaka. Specifically. Yeah, they both. Yeah, they both worked on it kind of in tandem, like they, you know, like they did with Xenogears and Xenosaga. Yeah, yeah. So they were told, which is funny because so many of the yeah. ideas ended up getting carried over into Final Fantasy VII. Anyways, they were yeah, told it <laughs> yeah. Was oh yeah, too dark and complicated yeah. for a fantasy. <laughs> Which is yep. hilarious because Final Fantasy VII is a very dark game. I know. Oh, you know yeah. Once you get, oh, yeah. especially once you get like into disc two or whatever, mm-hmm. like, which so yeah, it's, yeah, it's dark yeah. and complicated. And <laughs> yes. It, <laughs> yeah. Seriously. <laughs> but, but not as complicated as Zeno Gears. I mean, that's, I do that's have true. To, I that's do have yeah. To say that. Yeah. To be fair, that's true. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, imagine, I guess, if you will, the Zeno Gears story, but where. 
the mechs are summons instead of these. Mm -hmm. Oh, there you go. And that would be more or less, I guess, sort of the basic concept of what they pitched as FF7. Now, mm -hmm. um, Tetsuya Nomura had originally been working on Xenogears, had been assigned to that game, but was then was taken off of that to come be the, the concept artist uh, for Final Fantasy VII. So you see, that's maybe right. that's yeah. where mm -hmm. some of that bleed over of ideas happened, was him yeah, sure. to that project. And he was actually very involved in the creation of the story with Hironobu Sakaguchi for FF7. So you can kind of see where they, they borrowed from each other there. But, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so the idea that Soria Saga had written uh, was turned into something like Chrono Trigger 2 because they had both worked on Chrono Trigger before. Yeah. But that didn't work either. Again, they were like, this doesn't work. And they just made it its own yeah. IP, which was uh, Project Noah. Yes. Yeah. And, it would, and, and then interestingly enough, a lot of the staff in Xenogears would g later go on to do the actual sequel to Chrono Trigger, Chrono Cross. Right. Yeah. Like the staff uh, of Chrono Cross is almost literally like the staff of Xenogears, but without Takahashi and Tanaka. Right. Oh, interesting. It's, it's very, it's very, very close to one another. Yeah. yeah. Interesting. Chrono Cross is another game we'll probably cover at some point on this channel. Oh, I think it's, so. It's yeah. worth it. Yeah. There is a lot to say about that game. <laughs> yeah, for sure. So anyways, it was a, it was a massive undertaking. Another thing I failed to mention about Takahashi when I was talking about his personality and temperament. Um, Aside from being passionate and headstrong and, and, and uh, an auteur and all these things, he, he's also just an a insanely ambitious person. Oh, so <laughs> much. To say oh, the yeah. least, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. Uh, uh, basically to a fault, um, where yeah. his, his, directorial, agree, yeah. his directorial debut for Xenogears, um, if, if you're not aware of, of Xenogears, it, is, it was meant to be a six-part epic that would be told as a multimedia thing with anime and games and uh, a bunch of other things, probably manga and things like that too. Novels yeah. probably, yeah. yeah. Which had a, a time span of 15,000 years that it's trying to cover. Yeah. Um, from this like, from this sort of, in well, the discovery of the Zohar, which would mm -hmm. be kind of in our present day or yeah. in our past, all the way up to a, a galactic civilization to... Uh, a war and thing that's happening with there to a, a birth of a new civilization on a different planet. Mm -hmm. um, and then basically the leading up to a, a possible uh, cataclysmic event of that world. <laughs> so it's a massive, massive, ridiculously huge story. Yeah. Yes. Um, it's crazy. It's like he wanted to be yeah. like Homer or Virgil. <laughs> yeah. or he wanted to like craft a new mythology for the entire world going into yeah. the future, you know? And it's like, dude, yeah. like even beyond George Lucas, like he was like so ambitious. It's just yeah. unbelievable. Yeah. I mean, that was the first, like Xenogears was the first game that like he had worked on Final Fantasy VI and Chrono Trigger before, but only as like a graphic designer. Yeah. Yeah, this was true. kind of the first yeah. time that he had gotten free reign to do like story and everything like that, where he was in like complete control. So I feel like he just kind of went crazy because he could. <laughs> yeah. And he was still pretty young. Really so, young. oh, yeah. 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 And, you know, we talked about this a little bit. I don't want to touch on it too much, but, uh, uh, Kaysen and I, you know, our ambition was to be filmmakers and we were kind of taking right. a, a path to that with our very first YouTube channel we used to work on from like 2011 to 2015, 16, somewhere around there. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I go back and watch some of those videos and I remember kind of like how good I, we thought we were <laughs> versus oh, yeah. how good we really were yeah, um, right. and how we handled bigger projects when they came to us. Uh, we, we did a, a project for Machinima Prime, which is no longer. Oh, yeah. Here, but uh, oh, it, was, yeah. it was a fairly large budget uh, fan film for a Skyrim um, adaption, live action yeah. adaption hmm. that we did. And I mean, this even, even, you know, given what we're talking about is insanely small scale. Oh, and, yeah. And yeah. That was almost a total disaster from a, <laughs> from a managerial <laughs> standpoint. Um, yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, we, we got it done because the three of us who are running the channel have a jack of all trades kind of like skill set right. and could right. do what needed to be done with a very small crew. But yeah. like, we didn't have the money and time. We couldn't pay the actors when we were supposed to. The costumes weren't done on time. It was it was a freaking yeah. mess, and it was immensely stressful, and it, it required a lot of last-minute changes. 
to the mm-hmm. shooting schedule to what the story was really going to be, what we could actually do. And mm-hmm. um, so I understand even if it's just this much, like where Takahashi was coming from in terms of what he saw in his mind he wanted Xenogears to be versus right. what he could realistically do in two years with a, 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 a group of brand new rookie developers who had virtually zero experience with 3d development yeah yeah, um, yeah. And, I, and i should be said because you mentioned two years that was squares their mandate was like all right. new games have like two years of development that's it yeah. regardless of what yeah. game it is that you're doing mm-hmm. that's exactly right and so yeah he wants to make Fifteen thousand year Homer esque epic Xeno Gears, which would be like the greatest thing ever to come out as a video game story or as, as a narrative right. told in video games, and uh, that's just not realistic given <laughs> the context of the time. No. The team he had the time he had the software or, or, or sorry, the hardware he's working with, all those things. So Xeno Gears can be a rough experience because, of it. and and we go over yeah. this in our Xeno Gears podcast, yeah. but. They got to a point where they knew they weren't going to finish the game on time. And the the heads at Square, the executive, said, well, why don't you just end the game where essentially disc one of Xenogears ends? Just stop it there. And, oh and, and he was like, anyone who's played the game knows that's, that's absurd. Like, there's that, no way. That, 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 that would be, be, that would be horrible. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> it's just, uh, it's not even a cliffhanger. It's just not over yet. Like, it's just, it just ends in Act 2. It's just, like, the, the story's not done. Yeah. So uh, he decided to really change the way the story's presented on Disc 2. And this became kind of a... A mark of infamy for Xenogears is all oh, that disc two, you know, and people debated for years about, you know, why it was that way. All oh, these these developers got stolen off this team to to go make FF eight mm-hmm. and all these things that aren't true. Yeah, Finally, that was the that was the big rumor is that yeah. Final Fantasy eight kind of drained their resources and it yeah. come in a you know, come to find out later that that wasn't true at all. No. It was Takahashi's ambition got the best yes. of him. Yes, it was just too big a project. For- oh, there's a there's an old game in Japan called Nobunaga's Ambition. Mm. Oh yeah, about how he that, took yeah. over like all of Japan back yes. in the yes. like feudal Japan. We should make a game called Takahashi's Ambition. <laughs> <laughs> about how he's like plotting, and it just like doesn't quite work. Okay. Oh. So I say all that about Xenogears as, as we come up to Xenosaga here, because this is important context for the development of Xenosaga, because it goes. In a very, <laughs> it's very familiar the problems which he encounters. Yep. Um, yeah, you would yeah. think you would think you would learn after Xenogears, and it seems he didn't learn until the second strike, until after the second experience of mm-hmm. having the in, insane ambition and it not being able to be done the way you thought you were going to do it. And then by the time we get to Xenoblade, it seems like he steps into a role that he's better fitted for. Mm-hmm. rather than being like the director of the project uh, more of an, a, a producer role right um, yeah. an ideas guy who hands that to other people to go execute <laughs> yeah yeah um, which you do all the dirty work. work yeah yeah exactly so but, but it, it's important to understand just how passionate and ambitious the man is because that you that bleeds through these through, through these games you can really mm-hmm. feel it you can really see its potential and though it may fail to reach that potential in certain areas, when it hits, my goodness, yeah. does it hit. It is yes. profound how mm-hmm. amazing the storytelling in the game. Yeah. What were you going to say, TJ? Uh, what was I going to say? Um, I, well, I was going to say, like, for a game, like, and I think I mentioned this in my video, is like, for, like, technically, you could call Xenosaga a failure because, like, absolutely did not reach like where it wanted to go with Takahashi's ambition. But even so, like it manages to like when it's on, it is on. Yeah. Like, I mean, like it's, it's remarkable and yeah. Okay. So they began planning for a sequel to Xenogear at Squares. Yes. Takahashi and team but yes. this was right at, and we've talked about this ad nauseum. I'm not going to talk about this right now. 
right when the the, the turn of the century, uh, there's new management at Squaresoft. Uh, oh, yeah. <laughs> and, and Hiro Sakaguchi is no longer an executive vice president who was going to bat for people like Tetsuya Takashi. Um, uh, Yuichi Wada becomes the president of Squaresoft. His whole mm-hmm. philosophy was sequel, 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 sequels, like hit on our flagships and just yeah. milk those. Um, you know, I say milk, but like, obviously from a businessman's perspective, it makes way more sense yeah. to have already created assets for this game. Why not reuse them again in another game and right. you know, bring down costs and take advantage of something that's already popular. That, right. was, that was his philosophy. It won out in the end and that's the way Square went. So because there was so much focus on Final Fantasy in particular, um, which is the whole reason Takashi was frustrated in the first place. Uh, Xenos yeah. Gears 2 did not happen, and growing frustrated with that, he started a company of his own, Monolith Soft. Mm-hmm. The the term Monolith is is a reference to 2001 A Space Odyssey, which yeah. was the yeah. direct inspiration for the Zohar. The Zohar, right. Yeah. Um, which, by the way, Mike, I did read did you 2001. Read yep. Yes. Arthur oh, good. Zohar. Yes. I have now, I've read that book now. Dude. Let's it's really good. It real quick. <laughs> so oh, it's phenomenal. When we did the first recording of this case, and I, we were, we got into a little bit where we might not make it this time, but into the very first scene of Zeno's Saga. We're kind of analyzing. Yeah. Oh Bruce. God. Yeah. Oh, there's so much to say about that scene. Just in its <laughs> well, connection having, to 2001, dude, dude. Having not played that game, anyways, I I feel like I was able to uh, intuit a lot from that opening scene. Yeah. yeah. Yep. So, anyways, the the opening scene of Zeno Saga is the discovery of the Zohar. Um, mm. similarly to the discovery of the monolith on the moon in 2001 a space Odyssey, they, they sort of right. like excavate it. Um, but the, the point is, is that humanity comes in contact with this sort of like slab of it, it, it's, it's, um, an element that is not known, uh, to the mm-hmm. human race. They, they don't know what element it's made from. And, mm-hmm. uh, it, it essentially leaps humanity to a new stage of evolution every time they come. Across right. It. So, in 2001, A Space Odyssey, the film, you start with the, you know, the, the common ancestor, the apes that man evolved from. Yeah. Like what? Like going back like seven million years. Right. Yeah. Like that, way back. Yeah. yeah. And they, they encounter this monolith and touch it, and pretty soon they start to figure out how to use tools. And, right. uh, and you know, they start dominating the other sort of like monkey groups or tribes or whatever. And this is, you know, they throw the bone in the air and it turns into a satellite that's... Yeah, uh, yeah. You know, so, right, yeah. Shot. so it's great. I love the film. The novel is really different, and it really goes into a POV of one of these ape men from, you know, from the ancient past. Um, I feel like this particular ape man was more like one million years ago. It was, they were already erect, like Homo erectus. It yeah. was already like... Mm-hmm evolved quite a bit whereas in the movie it was chimp straight up chimps whereas in the book Mm -hmm. it feels more like humanoid type like homo erectus at at the very least yeah but it's just really it's really cool to see how that is described that process of like this evolutionary leap this like um this contact that just like leaps them forward from the pov of a character versus just this sort of like no dialogue in the film just monkeys kind of like jumping around screaming and afraid picking up bones and, uh, yeah. killing each you other <laughs> it's, yeah. it's really different again i'm not saying one's yeah. better than the other necessarily sure. it's just a really interesting different take so i was mm-hmm. i was asking case and like you should read it because it's really cool um and I, I i recommend that for the audience you read 2001 a space odyssey yeah. yes yeah i need to reread it it's been years since isla went last back and read it yeah it's it's, it's a so good book good. it's so good yeah um, oh yeah Okay, so um, Hirohide Sugi, Sugiura was the Sugiura, yeah. was the other guy who founded Monolith Soft together with Takahashi, and that's where that term Monolith comes from. Um, and so uh, they decided after a time that they wanted to go to publishers rather than trying to be completely independent. They wanted to have the backing of like an established publisher, so kind of become almost like a second party developer sort. Of. Right. Um, so they, they went to a bunch of companies, they were rejected by a bunch of companies, eventually Namco decided to take a chance on them. And, uh, this was largely because the president of Namco at the time, Masaya Nakuruma, 
Na- Nakamura, sorry. Nakamura, yeah, yeah. Yeah, uh, he was a big, he was just a big supporter. Uh, he, he really saw the, the vision of Takahashi. He wanted uh, to, to support that vision. And so his role in terms of like his relationship and the amount of freedom, really, that he gave Takahashi and the Monolith team um, was kind of unprecedented, I would say. Like usually you have an executive yeah. like that and and they they want to meddle and they want to have their hands in it and they want to make sure that the the marketing is is right <laughs> point and that they've done the you know the the market research and oh wait a minute well, maybe we should change this or that they kind of and this is against i, I actually learned this from watching some of your, your videos tj this is kind of against mm-hmm. uh goes against the the rumors about why xenosaga ended up the way it did a lot of yeah. it was the rumors were it was about corporate meddling and that actually wasn't the case yeah, yeah. I mean, hmm. I guess this is sort of getting ahead of the game a little bit, but yeah, the the rumor always was like after episode one came out, Namco stepped in and was like, um, you know, changing the the creative structure of the team, and that's. I mean, maybe we'll get to this later, but that's yeah. not how it was. Like every interview, I, I believe I read an interview with I think it was Kaori Tanaka, hmm. and she said like. Namco was basically almost totally hands off the entire time. Yeah. Well, just let them do let them do their thing. Yeah, that's that's amazing. It seems it seems like no matter where Tetsuya Takahashi goes, people are able to like feel his vision. People are able to like and I've never seen him speak before or heard him or anything yeah. like that. But it seems as though just from these stories of you got Satoru Iwata who loved the guy. He thought that guy was just a creative genius. You yep. have um, Hironobu Sakaguchi and Masaya Nakamura, these people who are big in the video game industry. And they were all like, this guy is off the charts yeah. creative. And never, it almost feels like as he yeah. would speak that that he could just get people to like join on with his vision. And he was yeah. able to... So it's not just his creativity in his mind, but he was able to convey it somehow and get the respect of these like yeah. high level executives. I never that's, thought of it in that in that respect, but yeah, you're right. Like he's able to command the respect and attention of yeah. all these like huge names, and I'm like, and I've never see, heard him speak either. I've just read interviews with the guy. So yeah, me too. Maybe he's just like ridiculously charismatic. I don't know. <laughs> I know it's it's got to be something. It's got to like be that. yeah, seriously. Yeah. So, anyways, he he basically gets this deal done the partnership with namco Mm -hmm. and they get started on an absolutely massive undertaking with xenosaga which i mean it 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 sounds i i've seen some people kind of react to this statement uh in a way that i don't think is 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 in is intended for those who say it i i know that that's very confusing i'll explain what i mean so (laughs) xenosaga i think an interesting way to look at it is this is a restart of the Xeno Gears universe. They're going to try yes, to do yeah. it again, but this time they can't use any of the characters that belong to the Xeno Gears IP. So they have to be careful about names and they have to be careful about certain things. Yeah. But there's yeah. so many obvious, obvious yeah, designs. That's exactly this it. This is supposed to be Saitan <laughs> and this is supposed to yeah. be. Yeah. You know and I mean? it's, if you look, there's a section in Perfect Works, which you guys talked about in your Xeno Gears uh, podcast. Um, where it sort of outlines like the history of the entire Xenogears universe yes. going back to like yeah. 2001 or whatever, whatever year it starts. Mm. And if you read that back, like after having played enough of Xenosaga, that section is very, very close mm-hmm. to what happens in Xenosaga. So it's, uh, and this is just a theory I have, like, cause I don't believe he's ever talked about it, but I, I feel like, if Takahashi had stayed at Square, like Xenogears Two would have been like a version of Xeno Saga set in the Xenogears universe. Right. Like he was thinking of this. He's been thinking of this story for you know God knows how long. Right. I know. Who knows? Um, but the yeah. the, the connections, going. yeah, the connections are like they're very, very, very clear. Like I know there's they're technically like set in different universes, but I would almost recommend like for people who are interested and in, who have played Xenogears, like read those sections of perfect works um, to help to better, like help, like see like what Takahashi was trying to do with the story. Yeah. So at the end of Xenogears, 
I guess this is kind of a spoiler, but, you know, approach that as you will, viewers, and maybe skip ahead <laughs> a little bit. At the very end of the game, it, it, it's episode five. It's a kind of really surprising yeah. thing at the very end. Oh, of yeah. I wouldn't That's consider that a spoiler. spoiler. I don't know. No. You guys don't know. You don't read the comments section of my videos. Everything's a fetching <laughs> spoiler to these people. <laughs> okay. Um, All right. So uh, it, it's, it calls it episode five, right? And right. I think what yeah. you're saying, TJ, is instead of making a sequel to Xenogears where he moves to episode six, he would mm -hmm. actually have gone back to try to do episode one. That's what I think. There. Yeah. 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 That's what I think. Because like that section of perfect works is very like it's very meticulously detailed. And a lot of the details, like I said, mirror stuff that happens in Xenosaga. Whereas in he talked in, in perfect works, he talks about episode six and there's a section. And I, I think it's really funny. There's whenever he talks about episode six, he's like, um, I actually don't know what I want to do for this part yet. <laughs> that's, the one. that's always the shaky one. I had heard that yeah. when he first gave like an elevator pitch for the mm -hmm. concept of Xenogears, he started episode one and he went, he's like, he, he was, he has the whole thing in his mind. Like he's been okay. thinking over and over and over yeah. and over. I mean, and he, yeah, it was, it's not Kaguchi or whoever he was talking to. He was like, I can get us all the way to episode six. And then it's a little fuzzy. Yeah. <laughs> and he would admit that. Like, yeah, I, right. I don't know how exactly it's going to end, but he's got like all this lead up to it, you know? Yeah. Well, it's got to be the return to Earth. Right? You, you would think that have to be where. Yeah. I, I, I don't want to, I don't want to say anything more because that's uh, potential spoilers. <laughs> okay. well, potential or, or it's the, he goes 2001, the book. Oh, new where the dude theory. basically it could be yeah like, it could be yeah given comes, yeah comes how much wave existence or something very powerful yeah something yeah. like that yeah uh, okay let's let's step back for a second uh, so okay, okay. Um, it's a okay so I wanted to talk about this a little bit I have a quote here let me read um, this is from Kaori Tanaka oh I haven't said enough about yeah. her yet um, yeah oh, Takahashi yeah. gets a lot of clout. For being like the creator of the Xenoverse, right? Yeah, he's kind of like mm -hmm. the face. Um, yeah. yeah, he's the face, but she is very much also that, and was yeah, she equally yeah. yeah, she's a good writer. Yeah, equally, yeah, if not more involved in the actual like putting pen to paper story. Yes, writing. yeah, I, exactly. I talked about her a lot in my videos because, like you yeah. said, I feel like most people know Takahashi's name, but most people don't know who she is, and that's a shame because. Yes. For two is. reasons, though, and they are both her fault. <laughs> oh, yeah. First of all, she doesn't go by her actual name. She's yeah, got like a pen name. That's Soraya true. Saga. Or Soraya Saga, yeah. Okay. Second of all, I have never actually seen her face. All of the pictures that I've ever seen of her, she is covering, purposefully covering yeah, her, face. her face. No, I don't think anyone knows what she looks I, like. I, there's a picture of her from like the early 90s, like right after she joined Square. But I think you're right. As like an employee like, photo? Yes, yes. Exactly. I think so, yeah. Like, hey, now that I think of it, yeah. Other like, than that, she <laughs> yeah. is, she can't be the face because she doesn't want to show that's, her face for whatever true. reason. I yeah. actually think she looks kind of pretty, but, what you know, whatever. Mm -hmm. She she doesn't want people to see her face. And then um, she doesn't want people to know her name. <laughs> so it's like, okay, <laughs> yeah. you definitely need a spokesperson then. You need somebody to be the name and face then if, if you don't want it to be you. So that's, you yeah. yeah, that's true. Yeah. But she is so talented. I can, I can just tell. Yeah. She is a phenomenal writer. Yeah. So she did an interview with games, uh, gamespot.com where she's talking about, you know, the sort of the feeling, and this kind of goes back to what you were saying, case the, the passion that sort of is contagious from Taka. Right. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so they had just come off of, you know, being sad about Xeno Gears and letting that go and having right. to restart. She says, Xeno Gears ended up differently. Oh, sorry. No, this is Takahashi. Sorry, I'll get back to Soria, or to Soria Saga. This is Takahashi first. Xeno Gears ended up differently from how I envisioned it. So we've decided to hit the reset button and start all over again with a science fiction story, which will be presented through a series of episodes encompassing the beginning to the end of the universe. Talk about, um... <laughs> Talk about over ambition, right? That's what I'm saying. This is the Odyssey. Like he's yeah. Homer. He's trying to be Homer. Yeah. Like this is so yeah. out there. Ambitious. In some ways, this is almost more ambitious than Xeno Gears. You're right. Was. You're right. It yeah, is because yeah. it's beginning and end. Yeah. So yeah. Yeah. there will be six episodes planned in all, all of which are mm -hmm. divided into three major parts. I already have the yep. story plotted until the middle of episode five in my head. 
Now, mm -hmm. I read that quote from Takahashi with a, a, a slight caveat. There is, and I think you use some of this video in your, your series, EJ, um, mm -hmm. it's all in Japanese, and he's kind of just giving some interviews about Xenosaga a little bit. I think uh, somebody who I know who works in Japan in the industry and who watched that video and sort of shared what's in it, um, this, this is obviously the big, uh, you know, three million sort of foot like view of what they want to happen, but it was not yeah. necessarily set in stone. They, they obviously knew based on what happens with episode one, uh, you know, the success or not success, we don't even know if we'll be able to make a cycle. So the, obviously they're going into this with the idea we want to do it this way. But it's not like they had done really any planning past just the first game that they were. So he wanted it to be six episodes long, divided into kind of three major, arcs, what we'll call mm -hmm. them. Mm -hmm. um, and, and this is important to note because I thought you made a really excellent point in your videos about how long it would have taken to actually execute that original <laughs> idea. Yes. That makes a lot of sense to me. And it's just like, okay, yeah. wow. And, and it sort of shows you how what would have been possibly the first arc out of those three arcs. So episodes mm -hmm. one through three, uh, or sorry, one, one and two, I guess, mm -hmm. yeah. of the six, it essentially became what we got in three episodes. Yeah, yeah. What, yeah, what we have is episodes one through three were, according to the initial plan, would have been the first two parts. Yes. That sounds confusing, but yeah. Yes. Um, and this is just like, this is just how I see it. Like what um, Xenosaga episode one and episode two, like, and I know we're not, this is getting a little bit ahead because episode two is obviously a whole different game. But yeah. if you play through all of episode two, like episode one, ideally was supposed to, was supposed to encompass the plot of both episode one and episode two. Like oh, talk right, about right, like, right. Like talk about ambition. Like, yeah. yeah. But it had to be. It had to be like cut in half. They couldn't fit it all in one game. Right. Yeah. Development time. Okay. So yeah. that was what he had in his head. And and like Kason was saying, up through the middle of episode five is plotted in my head. So he's got like almost all of it until you get towards like the very end of the plot. Right. Um. Now to the Kauri Tanaka um quote that I wanted. To we missed Xenogears so much, but overall, Xenosaga seemed like a fresh new start full of hope. So everybody was just, like, super stoked about where they were going with this. There was yeah. a lot, even though they had to kind of start over, so to speak. Oh, I forgot to mention, a bunch of Square employees left Square with yeah. Takashi. Yeah, like 20. 20. Well, yeah, it was about 20. It was, like I said before, it was basically almost the entire staff of who worked on Xenogears and by extension Chrono Cross. Yeah. Like those are the guys who left and there was probably some other ones, but that was the core of yeah. who formed. That's Malisa. sway though. That's yeah. a, he, like that's sway. Like um, somebody who can take people away from Square Enix and yeah. just like on their own thing. And it's like, Hey, yeah. I just started a brand new company. Do you want to come work here and yeah. leave your cushy job, you know, or maybe yeah. your more secure job. And, and yeah, he got 20 people to come over. And that I think that's a yeah, big deal. From Square like, at like the height of their power. Yeah. Yeah. At the top. Yeah. Yeah. And this is, um, this would be just people showing up because of how charismatic and how much they caught his vision. Yep. Yeah. It, very charismatic guy for sure. So mm -hmm. I, I'm sure off, he must be. <laughs> it starts yeah. off on the super high note. Everyone's pumped. They're ready yeah. to do it. And I think it's it's good at this point to kind of cut into what Takahashi said about the game in a Famitsu article in 2003. There's a lot of evidence here that an astronomical mm -hmm. amount of content was cut from this game. He says, oh, yeah. With episode one, we've managed to show only about 20% of the completed scene. Yeah. Episode one of six. What the heck? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, let me just let me let me cut what in for a sec. Like, so there's a there's a a trailer, one of the earlier trailers for the game. Um, and one of the scenes in that trailer is a uh, is a scene from 
what became the very, very end of episode two. Oh, wow. So it's like, so they mm-hmm. were intending to yeah, have all this stuff that was later in episode two. They wanted to put that all in episode one. And they just had to like, no, we can't fit any of this. Well, that trailer, well, all, that, was, that was kind of the reveal trailer for Xenosaga. I, I don't know if it was the reveal tra- trailer, the one I'm thinking of, but it was, it was one of the earlier ones for sure. But they, they said it was going to be six parts in text during that, uh, during that trailer, didn't they? They said a six part series or six part. I, yes, they did. They did. Yeah. Yeah. So even from way back at the beginning, like there's, there's evidence that that was the plan, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, but they only yeah. got through 20% of game one. Of, yeah, now, part now, I want, one. I want you to go over this. If development were to continue at that pace, how long would it have taken? To yeah, actually- <laughs> yeah. So I did the math. This was in my video on episode two. I, I ended up doing the math. Like, given how long the developments for this game was, had development proceeded on that pace, you know, given all these things, if it, if it had continued along that pace, the entire story would not have been finished until the year 2030 that's insane. so we'd be 30 so, so we're still here wow. yeah so th- the story would not even be finished now had they continued we still be sitting here the story not even be finished it'd be episode four it'd be episode halfway through maybe or maybe the oh, very start of episode five maybe, maybe. Yeah. yeah something like that yeah and, no. i mean this is not accounting of course for the the troubles of uh developing developing in hd with the the next generation consoles that came out and all the yeah they have yeah really yeah so engines for that and right 2030 mm-hmm. is the most conservative estimate like given all that it probably would have been like 2037 or something like that or mm-hmm. maybe even later i don't know so i i like mm-hmm. to think after having heard you say that in your videos that that's probably what was going through takahashi's mind at the end of mm-hmm. development of episode one and realize oh, yeah. like this is not going to work like this is no. absolutely yeah. not going to happen. And yeah. being totally heartbroken about it. I mean, just crushed that. Life. Oh yeah. And you can just tell like when he's been interviewed, like since the series has ended, like whenever he talks about it and he does not talk about these games very much at all. Mm. Like it's very like, there's a lot of regret. There's a lot of like, um, what's the word? Like melancholy. Like, I think he has like a lot of, um, I think that it was really disappointing for this to happen, like basically for a second time, like what happened with Xenogears yeah. on a know. larger scale. That's like, true. Yeah. The feeling of incompetency, the feeling like, yeah, I can't execute what's in my brain. Like why? Like, right. Why? And uh, yeah. also there you you have, he had less people to blame th- this that's, time. Yeah, that's true. You couldn't blame square. It was, he no, was the or guy. Even in like That's everyone true, yeah. let him do what he was capable of doing and he, yeah. he, he still couldn't quite pull it off, you know? That's yeah, that's true. Yeah. Yeah. So, and I feel like that melancholy, I know Mike, you brought up before, um, that it's felt even more like intensely, I think in following Kaori Tanaka's mm. career and how she kind of just like quit. <laughs> yeah. Like, I, it doesn't really work on games. Right. Like she just she, yeah. She, yeah. She's she's written like a couple. She's done a very a couple like smaller games here and there. Um, she's done some uh, for Xenoblade too. She did some uh, guest artwork designs and stuff. But yeah, for the most part, she's kind of left the industry. And, and you know, like, for someone as talented as her to like to turn to walk away from the level at sh- at which she was doing her job yeah uh, that i would assume that that's just like that's just it, a rough time it absolutely got to like if you yeah. find interviews like there's a couple interviews where she's mentioned like the you know the difficulties that they had and she you can just tell like even in translation like she is not happy with how that's things a, turned out yeah man. and like like that's the so details sad. are hazy, but like you know that whatever happened, like she, it got to her like bad. Mm. Well, yeah. So we've got some really great quotes about that, and and you had them in your videos. Uh, yep. And so I want to read some of these because it's really yeah. heartbreaking for me um, mm-hmm. to read, yeah. and and I'll explain why in a minute. But let me read read what he says here. Uh, 
Ta Takashi says, oh, if you want to make a single game, that basically means you need to spend two or three years of your life completing it. However, with the mm -hmm. world we're trying to display here, it's really nowhere near enough time. It'd probably yeah. take me decades to finish everything if it keeps going like that. So that, that mm -hmm. lends credence to, to what you're saying in, t in terms of the timeline you're talking about. Decades, right, multiple knew. decades. If they started yeah. development in 2000 or whatever, multiple yeah, decades they, is yeah. at least into the 2020s, if not the 2030s. Yeah. Yeah, at least the 2030s, I would say, yeah. To have completed this the way he originally thought. And this kind of comes back to what I was talking about with the, the projects Case and I worked on, which were, by comparison, just like minuscule in terms of mm -hmm. scale. <laughs> but yeah. you think, oh, as you're planning like how you're going to accomplish this, yeah, we can do this, this, and this, and it'll take roughly this much time. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it ends up being like four, five times the amount of time that you thought it was. Right. And, and that's yep. just something you get a feel for with experience. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, at this time, Akashi was still relatively inexperienced. I mean, he had been working as a junior developer all through the, the early 90s and late 80s as a director mm -hmm. from kind of the mid 90s. But like it takes a long time for you to really get a sense of, especially at a managerial position such as that. Right. How can I get all of these people together working on this thing in a time? Like, how much time is it really going to take? Yeah. And, and all things considered, he just hadn't really gotten a, a strong sense for that yet. And mm -hmm. that was what the problem was. It has nothing to do with his uh, his talent. It has nothing to do mm -hmm. with um, how great the, the concept is or, or anything like that. Or, or I, I think even necessarily technical limitation. Um but just how do I manage a project of that scale efficiently? And yeah. how can I realistically think about a timetable in order to go, well, that's not going to work. Let's cut this. Let's cut this. Yeah. That will make it a more smooth uh, yeah. dev, uh, you know, cycle. Right. And yeah, like I was saying before, like Xenogears was the first time like he had directed anything. That was his first time managing a project yeah, on that yeah. scale. And like, imagine that being the first project that you have to manage for anything like mm -hmm. that's that's and then you go on to something like xenosaga which is several times even more complicated than what he had to do for xenogears yeah it's 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 crazy yeah um he goes on to say uh when you deal too long with a single project i feel like it becomes harder to chase after new possibilities i don't want to limit xenosaga to its current state instead i'd like to explore other genres and other possibilities so this mm -hmm. is something I've read about him in the past too. He 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 said this about himself. I think in the Iwata asks interview that he gets bored with things pretty quickly. Like mm -hmm. he doesn't like to stay working on one thing for too long. He wants to kind of move on to something else. Um, right. So that's a problem. <laughs> when you that make, is a yeah. problem. Because here's the two things. Oh, I don't want to work on something for too long. Also, I want to tell a fifteen thousand year long story <laughs> yeah. that spans six episodes, yeah. going from the beginning of the to... universe to the end of the entire universe. Yeah, but I don't want to work on it for too long. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I don't know how to square that. Those that two poor things. guy. Yeah. Uh, so, anyways, um, yeah, I, I can imagine though uh, what a person who has as like emotionally sort of invested and involved in in his epic. This 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 thing he had been working on with his wife for decades yeah. already. <laughs> yeah. In terms of their conceptualizing the idea, probably as they're dating at SquareSoft, you know, in the early nineties, sure. all the way through Xenogears, and then all the way through they'd been working on this thing forever. And mm -hmm. um it having to be tragically, tragically cut short in this way, um, how much how that would have felt. He says, uh, there are things that even if you try to plan for, you'll never be able to express. With games as a mm -hmm. form of media, no matter where you set it, no matter where you set it, you have to make towns and all the little accessories. You end up doing annoying work with games. That's why I don't think it's a good medium for telling stories. I think it's better yeah. to call it a media for telling narrative things. I'm not quite sure what he means by that. It's kind of a funky yeah. translation, I feel. Yeah. Well, I, I, can I can kind of imagine what he's saying in Japanese there. Yeah. Mm. but yeah that's a that's rough yeah that's rough. I, to I'm me rough. i've always interpreted that interview as like sort of him coming to terms with like there's no way i'm going to be able to do this in the way i want like right. and sort yeah. of just him getting down on like not only himself but like just everything like 
everything that he had worked on for, you know, his entire career. Like he, he must've right. been in a very low place yeah. when yeah. he was giving that interview. Um, this does kind of lend into a change of philosophy though, that I have seen in the Xenoblade game uh, yeah. in mm -hmm. particular. They, they sort of sent out like, um, uh, a posting for they wanted to hire developers to come start working on Xenoblade 2 when it was in its conceptual phase. And he had a whole thing where he talks about how the most important thing in an RPG is not, he says, quotation, by no means the story, <laughs> mm. um, but rather that it's about maps, map creation. And, and, and that's okay. basically what Xenoblade is. It's giant yeah. freaking environments to explore. And right, the story yeah. is still really good. I really like Xenoblade Chronicles' oh, story. Yeah, um, yeah. Uh, Xenoblade 2 is another matter. We'll get to that at some point in the future. <laughs> but, <laughs> and I've played a little bit of Xenoblade 3 now. I really like it so far. Okay. Um, so, in any case, this, this, Xenosaga Episode 1 development was what changed his philosophy on making games. Yeah. It says here it's not a good medium for telling stories. I disagree with that. As right, me too. sale comment, and I'm not sure he would maybe I don't think, I don't think he would, I don't think he would stand by that today. I think... Sure. He yeah. was just in a bad place. <laughs> yeah, because this comes from the official design materials for Xenosaga in 2002. This would have in been like right after yeah. the game release. Right after right. the game, so so episode two would have probably been in development, and yeah, so I mean that was probably his lowest, the lowest, his lowest point at and, that and point. I yeah, let's talk about why that is for a second, because this is so fascinating to me. Um, mm -hmm. The rumor was that Namco came in and restructured Monolith Soft's yes. uh, st structurally from the inside on who does what. Yes. That's not what happened. Yes. And, and let me just let me add to that. The the rumor was they did that because specifically because Xenosaga was a commercial failure. Yeah. That was always the rumor. And none it of it wasn't that, is, that bad though it sold over a million units it wasn't it did, it like did. it did but it wasn't horrible it was comparable to xenogears but it wasn't yeah, like yeah horrible. yeah yeah that's what i but somehow that rumor got out and like mm. when, when a lot of people talk about xenosaga they're always like oh it was a big failure but like episode mm. one you're right it sold i think over like between japan and the u.s it sold like over a million units it actually yeah. did better in the u.s than it did in japan mm. um and I, I think, but, and even in Japan, it was like one of the best selling games of the year. So it was by no mm. means a failure. Um, the reason why the team, the, the creative team was restructured is because that's what Takahashi wanted. Yes. Ah, uh, yes. I heard of, about that. was that. sort of the, from the creation of Monolith, their, their idea was they were going to bring young developers and help them yeah. progress it in was, their careers. Yeah. yeah. Basically yeah. like give the young the younger generation a chance to sort of do their own thing with it, I guess. Yeah. So, so after episode one, the development, like the director, the writer and all these, you know, like all the big, you know, creative roles between episodes one and two, they all changed yeah. or most of them changed. And Maybe not is, all of them. This is crazy hmm. to me that this is the way they went. Now you can, yeah. you could, I could speculate, which is exactly what I'm going to do. Right. <laughs> It's such a draining experience for Takashi and Tanaka and the and the people who are in the, the kind of the higher senior development roles um, that it's just like oh my goodness we cannot do this the way we we saw fit to do yeah. we yeah. created this company with the expectation we were going to let younger developers have a chance to step up anyways mm -hmm. and I feel like I'm I failed again to do what I wanted to, to do with this. Uh, this world I created with my wife and I just like, I'm just, I'm fine. Just take it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> take it and run with it. I'm <laughs> that's done. How, yeah. I mean, that's, uh, how, yeah, sure, how, sure. that's how I interpret Takahashi. I, I don't think that's what interesting. Enough, I don't think that's what Tanaka, if you were to ask her, I don't think that's what she would have wanted because if you read interviews with her after that point, she sounds kind of pissed off <laughs> that yeah. all this happened. She seems real and, bitter about it. Yeah. Yeah, she does. And like, she's never spoken about it directly. Um, but there's, yeah, she seems very bitter. I think in her mind, ideally she would have retained her like, you know, main, like she would have been the main writer for the series as long as it would have gone, but yeah. that's not the direction they went. And, yeah. um, it's, it's really unfortunate that we don't have any clarification as to why, because Takahashi is, the founder of Monolith Soft. Yeah, I, I, 
I don't understand that either. And I mentioned that in my videos because like, like if that's what she wanted and by all indications, like that's what she wanted, like could Takahashi not have just stepped in and be like, okay, you can do that. You know, you can keep your role. Like, but that's not what right. happened. And they have not, they have not once spoken about this. Um, hmm. And so I don't know, I don't know what's going on there other than the fact that a lot of, you know, the development for these games were kind of a mess <laughs> from start to finish. So it's probably not, you know, something they want to look back on. It almost makes me hmm. wonder, cause I haven't looked into this. Maybe you have PJ. Mm -hmm. um, the formation of monolith soft, like what was the, like, cause there was, there was Takashi and Hirohide Sugiyura. Was there a mm -hmm. third guy? I think there's a third. Yeah, guy. there was. I the, read about Yasuki Hone. Yasuki Hone, yeah, yeah. yeah. So who was, uh, who was, a, I think, a, an artist, or well, he was an artist on Xeno Gears. He yeah. had some sort of art, artistic role. I, I don't remember what yeah. his, but yeah, yeah. So maybe it was a, it was a three-way vote kind of thing. And uh, was, right. And Takashi was voting. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, I don't know like the corporate structure of monolith soft other than takahashi mm -hmm. is obviously at the top or near the top but i don't know like the other two i don't yeah i don't know how power is vested between the three but it, it probably is something like that like a board got together and said we're going to do this and takahashi was like i i don't have the yeah. power to to yeah i mean that would seem to make that. the most that, that would seem to make the most sense yeah, yeah. I, I just can't imagine that he would like take his own wife off the project. I know, I, I can't, I can't either. I, I can't either. I no, especially even, yeah. E well, even with the general philosophy of hey, we're gonna train up the youngsters and let them direct stuff. You don't have to do it right away after the very first game yeah. and be yeah. like, okay, you're because they made other games. They made like a Baton Kaitos. Baton and, Kaitos, yeah. Yeah, there were a couple um, other games that they'd made that's like, hey, let yeah. let them direct those games. Like, you don't or, need yeah. to kind of upend everything. And after you yeah. made one game, it's like, hey, now the youngsters are directing right. all of our stuff from now or, on. Or even, like, just have a, a sort of a, a senior, like, even, like, keep her on as, like, a senior, like, I've been here since the beginning. Sure. Like, I can sort of be an overseer. That would like, be in a, a producer role. role or something. Yeah, right, right, exactly, yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's 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 really crazy. But here's what she has to say of what little she has ever said about. It. Yeah, supposedly the previous story I wrote in the first episode did not appeal to the new team's taste. I'm working on a freelance basis, so she wasn't an employee of Monolith Soft. That's what that indicates to me. That mm. yeah, that would seem to be the case. Yeah, if clients say they don't need my work anymore. That's all. No conflicts. No quarrels were there. That's I completely forgot about this because before, apparently before the the new creative staff were in place, Takahashi and Tanaka had written an entire script for episode two. Yeah, like they had an entire completed script, script for oh. the entire an entire complete script for the game, and, and it didn't get. For whatever reason, the new team was like, nope, we're not using this. It's I don't know why. It's crazy I, to me. I, I can't fathom why they would have done that, but that script was not used at all. Yeah. And huh. it, it, yeah. it's it, it, particularly given some quotes I'm going to read here from the new people who stepped into those roles. Oh God! It makes oh no yeah, sense I, know, I, I yeah, I know, I know what you're gonna say. And yeah, I'll get, I'll, I'll, <laughs> I'll air my thoughts once you've read them. Yeah. Yeah. So, anyways, I, I, I just kind of wrote this note to myself. Um, the story that so obviously meant everything to Takashi and Tanaka was dumped for a radically different version that barely resembled it in an incomplete and fragmentary way, and that really sucked. And yes. it sounds an awful yeah. lot like. How Final Fantasy 15's development went, where it was versus 13 at first, and it was Tetsuya Nomura's like baby. Yeah, it was uh, his baby. Yeah, he created, and it was taken from yeah. him and given to another director and torn to yeah. pieces and reshaped into something different. Yeah, because well, the yeah, yeah, because now that I think of it, that game, that development cycle for that game, it was years, and they had mm -hmm. barely made mm -hmm. any progress, and like. And after a while, it, they brought in new people. It's like, nope, we're just doing it this way, you know? Yeah. And yeah. yeah. In order to get it done, right? It's just right. Like we yeah. have to finish the thing. Yeah. To be, yeah. 
Yeah, to be fair, it had been in development for like six or seven years, and they had very, very little to show for it at that and, point. And a, a right. big part of that, too, and then this is a total tangent from Xeno stuff, but it's because Tetsuya Nomura was being asked to make freaking a billion Kingdom Hearts games. <laughs> like, <laughs> That's true, yeah. I know. That's like, true. <laughs> dude, it, like, you can't make all those and do this at the same time. Yeah. But anyway, so let's talk about some of the guys who stepped up to take lead development roles for Episode 2. Okay. Ko Arai who actually mm -hmm. was a Xenogears guy. Yes. He has, a, he has a great quote from the original Xenogears. I think it was in one of the manuals. I don't think it was Perfect I Works. Think it, I think yeah. it was in Perfect Works. He had some quotes. I, he had some quotes in there. Um, I, I could yeah. be wrong about that, but I know he had some quotes in there. Well, he talks about how horrible the experience was. And like it was complete. Oh, <laughs> oh, maybe it wasn't that way, but I, I've seen that quote. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's like it was, it was hell. Um, yeah, like I can't like, believe we finished. I can't believe we, believe we, we got the sun. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, so that guy who <laughs> hated that experience came with <laughs> Takahashi to Monolith Soft to try and do it again. Right? Wow! <laughs> this, we're yeah. talking about the char the charisma of uh, yeah, Takahashi. yeah. That's a, that's a good point. Yeah, <laughs> like imagine if if the experience is hell. It's like yeah, I'll <laughs> yeah, follow you, I'll dude. Go through that again. Yeah, yeah let's make it even yeah. bigger this time. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh my god. So he, he steps up to be the director of episode two. Yeah. This guy is and, that and involved in it. Let me just say, yeah, like he, well, I wonder if he had been promised that then. If, I don't know. If like, Takahashi's like, hey, I I could let you direct. Yeah, it, well, it's interesting because he episode two was the first game that Arai directed. Like his role in Xenogears was I'm not gonna remember. It was it was like a it was like a map designer role or something and like in episode one it was something similar and then all of a sudden he's put in charge of this huge project yeah. and and like mm. this and it was like yeah it was like he's never directed anything i believe xenosaga episode two was like the fifth game the dude has ever worked on so like talk about being in over your head like yeah. oh my god seriously seriously <laughs> Mm. So he steps up to direct episode two. This is his direct? I believe he directed episode three as well. He did yeah, yeah. Um, and then you have Norihiko uh, Yo Yonasaka, Yonasaka yep. who replaced Tanaka to uh, Soria Saga as the scriptwriter. So those right. are two really big people who are filling in yeah. enormous shoes for them. Yeah, the biggest two. Yeah, yeah. Um, so. Uh, Yonasaka had worked on Ark the Lad and Front the mm -hmm. Front Mission series. Front Mission. Yep. Um, I think he, I think he had a role. I don't. Re I think he had some sort of role in Xenogears. I don't remember what. And I know he had a role in Xenosaga Episode One. But again, I don't remember. There were minor roles, though. Yeah. So nothing as big as as something like this. Yeah, the and and for Yonasaka, I don't think it had anything to do with writing. Yeah, um, his his roles in the, on the other game. Yeah. 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 Right. So now he's going to write Xenosaga yeah. episode two, right? Yeah. He's yeah. Going to I, I don't know. I Soria Saga's yeah. script, and he's going to write his own. <laughs> yeah. Like I don't know. Again, like <laughs> how these two guys were chosen, other than like they were the next generation or whatever. But who in their right? Who would have decided? Like, okay, you you're the you're the guys. You're the you're the ones who are going to be in charge of this. Like, I don't know who made those choices, but oh. it's mm. interesting that it was those two. <laughs> Well, Ko Arai goes on to describe their role, the, the two of them, um, Yon yep. Yonasaka and Arai's role of making the second episode as being similar to adapting a screenplay from an original work. So, it, like, the, the role of Peter Jackson in adapting the Lord of the Rings novels to film. He's right. likening his role as the director of a sequel to a video <laughs> game as if almost like they're adapting something from another medium. Like, that's... Well, yeah. <laughs> this is um which um, I mean this is the new Star Wars trilogy, right? Yes. <laughs> You've yeah. got episode eight, and it's like, yeah, I'm gonna treat all that as like what is it? What what's the Jack Sparrow? What's the Pirates of the Caribbean? The guidelines. They're they're more like <laughs> guidelines than actual rules. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. Throw it, up, throw it out and then do whatever you want, you know? Yeah. It's pretty much yeah. what they did. Which is amazing yeah. because it must be repeated. There was a full script to the game already written yeah, yeah, <laughs> that yeah. they could have, that was just sitting there. Like you could have used it guys. And they didn't, they didn't want they to did not, they reason. did not. So, yeah. Uh, well, then they wouldn't have been credited. That's true. Writers. That's need, true. Need the, need that cred. We, I mean, yeah. that's, that's speculation, but it's, I think it's fair speculation that yeah. you get a chance 
to really be a lead developer, you want to leave your mark on something. You don't want to just do something someone else came up with. But yeah, at the same I, I, time, at the same time, yeah, the Xeno you want games, it to be good. <laughs> the, the Xeno games are auteur works. Like, yeah, if there's anything that I would describe that way, it would be freaking Xeno yeah. Xenoverse. So right. if, if mm. anyone's going to take on the role of telling those stories in the place of the original creators, you would yeah. have to have at least like a, a competent understanding of what like the bigger picture is of what they're going for, right? Yeah. And, and yep. when we say that, we mean you've got to read Nietzsche, you've got to read Carl Jung, oh, yeah. you've got to read, mm -hmm. oh, yeah. you know, like a, a lot of philosophy yeah. and psychology yeah, like and religion. Yeah, the the to Bible. You got to know the Bible front to back. The, the freaking you gotta know. The Book of Enoch, man. You got to know yeah. the Book of Enoch. Book of Enoch and all the Gnostic scriptures. Yeah. And, yeah, yeah. yeah, this is what you have to know to tell the Zeno gear or Zeno yeah. story. And yeah. I'm pretty sure these guys did not know that stuff. Uh, oh no! To their own oh. admission, as I'm about to read. <laughs> oh God! This, so, yeah. So this is a quote from from Yonasaka. Mm -hmm. I feel that the world of Zeno Saga is something <laughs> deeper than just fantasy. I still don't understand all of it, and I think it might take me years to arrive oh, at Takashi's level of insight. Oh my well, god! Duh, wow. Because yeah. it took them years to arrive at the level of understanding yeah. of this stuff. They, they, uh, they had studied for decades before they tried to create the story. Of course yeah. you don't understand all of it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, you know, Tetsuya Takasha must really just not have wanted to have anything to do with episode two. Well, I he, can understand yeah, why. But. He, yeah, I mean, he definitely didn't, but at the same time, like, uh, like... Like, he didn't even want to, you know? No, no, I mean, and he was, like, I, he was, he was, cr he was credited on that game, but it was very much, like, basically, like, he's the guy that created, like, he didn't Just really have general, any, yeah, he yeah. didn't have any, like, any sort of advisory role or anything, like, he, yeah. he was, didn't do anything, yeah. I... I can, as, as again, as little experience as I have had in any sort of, you know, storytelling experience, I, I mm -hmm. TJ might not know this, I mention it quite a lot on the podcast, but I've been writing this yeah. fantasy novel for... Yeah, oh, uh, yeah, I do, or, yeah. 20 years now I've been writing this thing. Um, mm -hmm. It is absolutely, probably my most prized possession in a sense it's like the most important thing to me that i've created and and it's like it's uh, there's so much emotional investment in that thing so mm -hmm. if i imagine that i got to write novel number one or something and uh for, for whatever reason the thing was getting out of hand in terms of like my ability to maybe finish that and, and i had a contract with some publisher to write three more books in a certain time, which does happen. Right? <laughs> oh, right. Yeah, right, yeah, so, right, right. So they take my novel two and they give it to a different writer. And that writer decides, no, I want to write it this way because this is what makes sense to me. I, I just, that's the, that's probably the attitude I would have. Okay, fine. Fetch it. Like, I'm yeah. out. Yeah, who cares? Yeah. Like, okay. Th yeah. That's the only way you can cope emotionally with that is to like, fine, yeah, fine, sure. whatever. I don't care just, anymore. Just uh, do it. Yeah. Th think about, <laughs> think about being like the the parent of a child and yeah. like giving up the child for adoption, but still like kind of being there, like, oh, but I can still see the kid every weekend, right? Or I can still like, here's here's my baby, but like maybe like every month or so I can still come by and like be the, the thing's parent for a little bit, you know? And it's yeah. like, no, that's not how adoption works. It's right. like you, you have to get out. Otherwise yeah. that kid's going to get confused. Yeah. Yep. And so <clears throat> obviously that's kind of where he was at. He was ready to yeah. just kind of walk away from it. And uh, you talk about this in your videos, TJ, about how he mm -hmm. was credited in episode two. Right? Yeah. And I'm not going to remember. I don't know if you wrote I have, down. I have it written down. So, okay. He's credited as, and this is important wording, original author mm -hmm. and supervisor to the author. So whenever right. you see oh supervisor to the author is interesting. So whenever you see original author on something, especially yeah. in a screenplay or a movie, yeah. that means it's probably not the same story they wrote. They they wrote right. an old yes. version that they have to be credited for because it was based yeah because it came from his head yeah. But the story that you got is probably really really different than what they had. So, yep. yeah, but his, his it's, role yeah. on episode three. Yep. Oh, sorry. I was wrong. This is why you were confused. 
Oh, okay. It, it was just original author. That was his only credit, right? On for episode Zenosaga, two. Episode two. Mm. Yes. Okay. Yeah. That's that makes more sense. And yeah. His 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 uh his role on the third game was supervisor to the author, music coordinator, and supervisor of scenario and database. Yeah, yeah. A little more interesting. Yeah. 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 I was gonna say with episode three, at least if we're going by the credits, he did have um more hands-on role somehow um i can only speculate because the uh amount of knowledge that anybody knows about the development of episode three is basically non-existent yeah right really there's there's very little yeah there's nothing the only Uh things that i can that i've ever been able to find is interviews not with monolith themselves it was the public relations arm of namco yeah who did like pre like who did like publicity interviews before the game came out. There is not a single interview about like with any of the developers um, they, they regarding episode out. three. They were done. Yeah. Yeah. I, yeah. <laughs> which, which, which says like, which says so much, but yeah. So yeah. So his role was entirely like just super minimal on episode two. On episode and, two, yes. And he was he was ready to just hand the thing off and walk away from it at, in frustration, probably defeat at that point. Yeah. And I want you to take it from here, TJ, because you have some really excellent examples, which you, you might not necessarily need to go over here. Maybe we can just point to your videos for people to see that. But the yeah. directorial, the difference you can tell in, in direction and, and mm-hmm. why, why is this scene even in the game and like how, you know, like... Tell, tell me a little bit about your impressions on the differences in directorial style between one and two. Oh, God. Yeah. I mean, it's more than I mean, it's the direction. It's the writing. It's kind of just everything. Yeah. Um, like the big thing. And even back in, you know, when I first played episode two, when I was in high school, um, like I noticed it kind of right away. And it was sort of this it, it sort of was this like creeping dread, like, Oh my God, maybe episode two is not going to be as good as episode one. (laughs) Um, uh, which was vindicated because it's not, um, but it's like, (laughs) but I think the way I describe it in my video is like, it's like, it's like akin to like, like if you're like a, like a high school student and you watch like a Shakespeare play and you sort of get like the big, like you sort of know what's going on in the big picture. But if you're like asked to fill in like the details and to, grasp like okay what's like shakespeare like specifically what is he saying with his language here and he's like i don't know um sort of like sort of knowing the basic story beats but like not sort of knowing their significance really i mean in episode two whole right like understanding sort of the thematic or yeah lens to what we're trying to get at yeah, but there's like there's so much like missing in terms of world building and like attention to detail and mm-hmm. like just the stuff that in episode 2 that the directors like that they chose to focus on. Yeah. Um and like there's a there's a specific scene in the it, it's at the very beginning of of the game uh where they're on where they're on this planet and there's this this ridiculous car chase scene. That goes on for, I want to say, like, the cutscene goes on for, like, maybe five or ten minutes because it's a Xenosaga game. All the cutscenes go on for that long. But, like, it goes on for a really long time, and then it goes into this, like, you know, it goes into the gameplay where they're being pursued by by these guys that were chasing them in the car. And it's, like, spent, like, two, two and a half hours or something, some ridiculous amount of time on this thing that in the grand scheme of things means nothing. It's, it's just, it's just complete filler. And it's like, Mm. why are you wasting? Like this universe is so massive and expansive. And there's so much in the story that needs to be told. Why are you doing this? You know, why are you focusing on this? And I could go on and on. I mean, just like watch the video the video is like an hour and 15 minutes and it's just me <laughs> ripping it to shreds because it's like it's literally like like i can i can see myself getting started like i could just go on and on like every single point in that game is like why did you do this like it's yeah it's it's kind of like it's fascinating how um how far that game fell from episode one it's remarkable yeah and so mm. I, I want to make a quick note here. Um, 
And this is kind of also a, a more of like a what to expect from our podcast type of thing if you're a new viewer. Um, mm-hmm. Criticism is going to be a part of what we do. And it's never, ever intended to be a, uh, you know, bashing of the developers or to tell them to, to, to talk about how bad they are at their job, nor yeah. is it to, you know, uh, throw shade at anyone's taste who might really like, let's say, Xeno Saga Episode 2 um, yeah. or, or think it's the better of the three or anything like that. Uh, opinions are what they are. And, you know, that's not really the point. Um, yeah. The point of criticism is to have a conversation where you try to get at the core of what you feel like the work is going for. Okay, this mm-hmm. is what we know based on the research we've done into what they've said about what they wanted to make. Right. This is where we know it changed hands to a different set of creators. This is the differences in style between this one and this one. Okay, mm-hmm. why is that? Why did that happen? And hopefully you gain insight where you learn from that and you can share that insight and maybe someone takes from it. And and, uh, this is not to say that our podcast is the answer to anything. It's one piece of enormous community of people doing this, but hopefully developers learn from this level of dissection and the medium grows as a result from it. So Mm -hmm. this is never intended to be like, this game sucks. And if you like it, your opinion's stupid. (laughs) You know, yeah, I'm gonna rip this thing to shreds, even though you like it. And if you like yeah. it, you're wrong. That's not the point of criticism, right? And, and, <laughs> yeah, I mean, I know it is for like internet trolls, but that's not what we're talking. <laughs> right. About. So yeah, yeah, I like, especially in this format, to dissect stuff that I don't think is good because it's fun and fascinating in its own way to learn from mistakes, right? And to mm-hmm. learn from okay, they had this idea. That's not what happened. Why? Can we get into this and like figure it out? And so yeah. that's the point of criticism. So please don't take it personally when we criticize the things that happen, you know, in these games. Yeah. Yeah. And I have to and I have to give the developers credit because I would say that they themselves must have taken those lessons to heart because the amount that they grew between episode episode two and episode three yeah. is stratospheric. Yeah. I've like, heard. It, yeah. I've it's, heard it's, three is actually episode, episode three is incredible. Yeah. yeah. It's I think episode one is still my personal favorite, but if someone, you know, came to me and said, Oh, episode three is the best of the series. It's like, yeah, I completely understand. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. And so this is kind of a good uh, segue point um, Mm -hmm. to working into episode three, because it seems somewhere along the line, Takahashi got a new sort of like, um, like, like a new spark to kind of get involved. Yeah. He wanted to kind yeah. of jump back in, you know, and I can understand that too. You, you get real emotional about something not working out and you have to step away from it for a second and calm down and sleep on it a little bit. And then you go, okay, wait a minute. Maybe we could do it this way. Maybe. And then you jump back in and you problem solve and yeah. you get it yeah. done. So yeah, obviously, that's obviously something like that happened because it wasn't just that he got more involved in episode three. Um, He also kind of retold a lot of the episode two story and changed it with the DS release of Xeno Saga episode one and two. That's Uh, right. Yeah. Because the DS, mm. because I I will say the the DS, and this is kind of why it's such a shame that that game has never been released in English in any form. Uh It went back and like sort of retold that same story, but based it more on his, what I assume is his, original script yeah. that he had for the game i'm assuming i've never seen the script obviously but but yeah. yeah closer to what his original vision for that story would have been well because from what i understand the episode one portion of that ds game is more or less exactly the same as the story in episode yeah one. from from what i uh, and again i haven't played the game at all i've just researched as much as i you know as a non-japanese speaker can right. Um, but there are lists of like all the things that have been changed, you know, that like, these are the changes from episode one. These are the changes from episode two. The changes from episode one are very, very minimal. Um, like they're so like, they're not even worth mentioning that that's how minimal they are. But like in episode two, it is extensive. Yeah. It's extensive. And there are a lot of them. Yeah. <laughs> hmm. yeah. So he wanted to jump back in. He saw how that went. He was like, no, 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 no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean that's how I've always read it. Is like, because because yeah. I mean like the the game, it wasn't it wasn't as as far as sales wise, it wasn't as successful as episode one. Not by you know any not metric. nearly. 
Oh, no, it, yeah. it sold maybe like half as many copies if that. I and, heard even less. I'd heard it was somewhere close to a quarter. Yeah, I mean, I, yeah, I don't doubt that. Um, it's hard. It's hard to know that, but yeah, yeah. yeah I think the the sales data is can sometimes be kind of not yeah. the easiest to come by. And then, like yeah. critically, especially among fans, um, you know, episode two has always been kind of the black sheep of the of the series. And I've always read his greater involvement in episode three is, is like. Because episode three, you know, after a certain point, it was decided like episode three is going to be the end. Like this yeah. is going to be the final game. Right. And, you know, I've always read his involvement as being like, if this is where it's going to end, like I need to step back in. Like I can't have it be like, I can't have it be like episode two be what it was. And then me not be there to sort of guide it to some right sort of ship. Yeah. yeah. Okay. I can have a direct quote from him. He said, uh, "Okay, if this is to be our end, I would have us make <laughs> such an end as to be worthy of remembrance." That's, I'm pretty sure what he said. I, I, I yeah. might have I might have paraphrased a little. Maybe, but it's close enough. <laughs> <laughs> um, oh, yeah. Man. So that release uh, is evidence to me that you know he kind of wanted to step in and sort of fix it and get it back on the right track. Um, mm-hmm. I know that. Soria Saga also wrote the Pied Piper. Um, ah, yes. Oh, yeah. The, 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 yeah. Yep. That was released exclusively for like Japanese phones. Japanese cell phones. Yeah. And apparently it's really well written from what I it is. It is very well written. Um, I certainly. Yeah. And that and, story and it serves as a prequel to even episode one, right? Yes. Yes. It's yeah. technically it, it focuses on. Um, sort of the background of one of the main characters from the series, Ziggy. Um, Something that happens, you know, very much in the past from even when episode one begins. And it it sort of goes into a lot of like, you know, a lot more details of like world building. And, you know, it's, it's a lot, I guess I would describe it as a lot more like what we would expect from a Xeno game, (laughs) like between like Xeno gears and episode one. And from what I understand, that story was sort of always meant to be told oh. in like the main series at some point. But mm. I feel like because of the development problems they had, it had to be excised and sort of made into a side thing. Yeah, well, yeah this could have um, could have been one some of the eighty percent of what was cut from episode one. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I, I think it definitely was. And and my sort of in, in my mind, I'm thinking like maybe like the script of Pied Piper was taken straight from that script for episode two that they decided mm. not to use yeah. oh, okay. it's certainly possible i don't know but um but yeah i mean like i said tanaka she was the sole writer credited on pied piper and it shows nice. like yeah. the the writing quality is it's very much better than it was in episode two in, in is, my opinion there is a translation uh, out there there is a translation yes oh, good. um yeah it's it's yeah, you, you'll link to it. Yeah, but uh, but uh, yeah, it's it's definitely worth reading if you are uh, if you are that much invested in the story. It is absolutely worth reading because there's no way you're going to get your hands on a Vodafone to play it. Yeah, likely. Vodafone, <laughs> not anymore. From 2004. <laughs> yeah, from Japan. Yeah, probably not. Gonna yeah. Happen. No, um, it's not. And that that ended up being Kaori Tanaka's last contribution to the series, and then she pretty much was gone. Yep, yep, that was, uh, as far as I know, she did not have any involvement in episode three. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that would, yeah, that would have been her last role. Um, so like you were saying, there's almost nothing in terms of interviews or any kind of dev history on episode three. Almost. Yeah, nothing. yeah, so, almost not. Aside from like the two uh, interviews I saw with Namco, that is literally it. And one of the quotes you pulled from there, which I like, was, th- again, this is some namco bandai pr person Mm -hmm. by all means we took the fans request into consideration the changes are also a reflection of what the creators thought was best for the series in episode three this time the result was something very close to what we believe to be the original ideal and Mm -hmm. it seems to me you being someone who's played it that episode three takes that roller coaster that went way down here and brings it back up to the heights again yeah, in a and way that maybe seemed impossible. I mean, yeah, it, it was kind of remarkable because the last time I 
replayed the game. It was at the very end of last year, like right before I started writing the scripts for my videos. And it was like, I knew I always liked, you know, I, I, I always liked the game ever since I first played it. But this last replay, it was like, this is so much better than this game has any right to be. Yeah. Like, <laughs> I, and, and it's like, I, I give them a lot of slack because like, between like what happened with episode two and the fact that they had to just cut the story off, like they're only doing like a fraction of what they wanted to tell anyway. Like there's no way that they were going to, you know, the, there's no way that they were going to be able to tell the story in exactly the same way that they would have ideally liked to. But even, even with all that being said, like it's, it's kind of amazing how they were able to, and I, obviously can't say anything in any great detail because with episode three, like anything I say is like going to be a spoiler, yeah. but like, like it's, you know, once you get there, it's like, it is remarkable how they managed to tie everything up yeah. as well as they did. Like I give them all the credit in the world for doing that because under anyone else's hands, like there's no way they would have been able to do anywhere near that good of a job. I think. Yeah. That's really fascinating for me to know before going into it. And I, I do think it's really important to have the right expectation before you play something. Yes. Especially when there's yeah. a second part that's supposedly bad. <laughs> so that yeah. you don't give up on it, right? So that you'll know it's going to lull here. Just know that. And then it's going to come back up to this point. I'm really yeah. excited to see how that comes together. Mm -hmm. um, so it's going to be a while before we get to episode three, most likely. Oh, yeah. But yeah. Uh, but I am really excited to see how they were able to accomplish that because from 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 what I can tell from watching your videos and stuff, like mm -hmm. it seemed like it, it had just been totally thrown into the gutter and there was no recovering the story. And somehow Takashi steps back in and makes it work, and that's great. Yeah, yeah. Like, and I don't want to give him all the credit necessarily, sure. but I mean, it's like the. But at the same time, it's like he stepped back in and all of a sudden they managed to pull it, pull out this miracle. Yeah. And that's the only real way I can describe it. So like yeah. Wh yeah. wherever that sort of inspiration came from, like, thank God that it did. <laughs> and that it ends on a satisfying note. Right? <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. So to kind of wrap up dev history here, I just want to talk a little bit about where monolith soft went after this. Um, so Namco had a merging with Bandai right around this mm -hmm. time with Xenosoft yeah. 3 coming out. Yeah. And um, Masaya Nakamura was no longer like the top guy anymore. He had more of like an honorary role in, in the company. And he was kind of the, the tie between Monolith and, and Namco, them being allowed to have the freedom to do exactly what they wanted to do, which was Takashi's whole reason for leaving Square in the first place. And it seemed right. like they were much less willing to take risks at this point. And so it mm -hmm. came to a point where uh, it was time for Monolith to find a new publishing partner. Um, and Iwata, uh, Satoru Iwata was the yeah. president of Nintendo at the time. Um, Nintendo steps in and buys controlling stake of Monolith Soft yep. for their new project that they were developing, which at the time was called Monado Beginning of the World. It was mm -hmm. this fresh new thing. They had finally gotten away from this Xeno stuff and they were <laughs> yeah. making something different. And then it ends up being Xenoblade. <laughs> Xenoblade. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Named in honor of his work with Xenogears right. and Xenosaga. I think it was Iwata yeah. specifically. It was his idea to rename it Xenoblade. Yeah. 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 But, but just Interesting. Just I did not know that. That, you know, fans would know from the name and, you know, right. maybe capture some of that. Um, and against all odds, I mean, seriously against all odds, because I was involved in the, uh, the, the, not at the level of like running the, the yeah. campaign for oh, the project rainfall. rainfall. Yeah. But I was one of the people in the trenches emailing them every day and calling them all the time and oh, sending man. physical mail to them to get Xenoblade released in America. Um, Against all odds, that ended up being the major commercial success that, that got Monolith and Takahashi yeah. uh, the clout that they had deserved in yeah. the beginning. Oh, yeah. yeah. And now we're going on Xenoblade 3, which has apparently sold really, really well. Yeah, People one of the biggest games of the time. year by a mile, yeah. Huge, huge. So yeah. he finally got that breakthrough success. Good for him, yep. for Monolith. Mm -hmm. um, 
And, uh, you know, all the struggle they went through led to a payoff eventually. Thank goodness. Yeah. Um, but uh, that's kind of the story of Takahashi and Monolith and, and the Xeno Saga games from what we can actually glean. Um, yeah. And, and, and everybody, please go watch TJ's videos. They're exceptionally well done. <laughs> Um, <laughs> well, thank you again for that. I, 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 I have two notes that I wanted to bring up before oh, um oh, yeah. before we end here. Mm -hmm. Um first of all, it's important to note with the development of Xenogears or Xenosaga mm -hmm. that the the game engine, the graphics engine oh, right. was only oh. finished six months before the release of the game. Oh yeah, yeah. So back twenty years ago. There wasn't an Unreal Engine that people could just license, and now you have a, a ready game engine to just use and put your assets in, yeah. and it works. Um, right. It, these uh, these developers had to create their they own built it from scratch. Engine. Yeah. yeah, they built it from scratch. They would code it from the ground up, and mm -hmm. so while the game um, had been, you know, they had been working on the game for two years. They were creating models. Yeah. They were doing artwork. They were writing the script. They were creating the mm -hmm. scenarios. They were creating the levels and all of that stuff using whatever 3D programs they were using. Right. Um, they weren't able to actually implement it into the game until six months before the release. And that's when it was like, hey, yeah. let's start making it all come together. And this is where the gameplay yeah. meets the, you know, right. all of the other dev works that they've been doing. And that's not very much time, man. Six months. No, my gosh. No, no, and and I mean, imagine how hard that because they started development in two thousand. That was yeah, the same yeah. year that the PS2 was released, yes. and obviously uh, the Xenosaga, you know, was a PS2 series. So, like, they were. I mean, this was uncharted territory for basically everybody involved. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Because yeah, the, the this level. I guess the Dreamcast came out in ninety nine, but <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I, yeah, but I, but the, but yeah. this was yeah. I would well, say this was in another level even from that. Oh, yeah. totally, absolutely. This is, this is something they talk about even at FF 10s development about the struggle to like get a handle on the new hardware being like a major factor in development, and it only yeah. gets worse after this PS three engine creation. Oh like yeah, oh harder. I've heard horror stories. I know, that. And, yeah. And, Certain companies still just they want to make their own engine. They do not want to use Unity or Unreal yeah. or any of I mean, the prepackaged. I mean, and I, was, I respect that, but yeah, that was Square's expensive. big big issue for like. Oh, I don't know if they moved beyond that, but that was like a they big a factor app. with. Oh, they did. Okay, yeah. thank God. They yeah, used, they used um they used Unreal for Final Fantasy VII remake and Kingdom. That's Wars. what I've heard. Yep. Yeah. yeah. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah. Well, that's yeah, but that was one of the issues with 15. Final Fantasy thirteen. And Final and Fantasy 15, 15 they're yeah. trying to create their own engine still. And it's yeah. just like, dude, this is not and, an efficient and way. Yeah, and I, yeah, no. and I hope they learn the lessons because it didn't work out that well for them either time. I right. think so. That being said, I don't want every game to be developed on Unreal or Unity. <laughs> that's, <laughs> that's, but that's, that's true, yeah. It's like, okay, if it's going to delay your game 10 years, yeah, maybe maybe just use one of yeah. those. <laughs> right. Existing, think, yeah. Anyways, so I have that general note, right? So, mm -hmm. um... The last note that I have here, well, there's a general idea about the designs. The eyes were too big. So the graphic designers, or the not the graphic designers, but I guess the general artists, right, who were drawing the characters, the character mm -hmm. designers, they drew the, the characters to the liking of Takahashi, but when they were imported or when they were translated into the 3d all of a sudden they looked like these bug-eyed like freaks <laughs> like, they weren't able to wrap the texture around their their low-ish poly yeah. models effectively yeah. enough right to where they actually had to do a lot of work they were able to eventually get it right okay uh, but takahashi wanted to keep the big eyes yeah. but in certain lightings it just looked kind of funny and creepy and so it took them a while to kind of make sure that they get everything right and to oh. make sure the scenes are lit in such a way that it didn't look that it didn't look so Weird. bad yeah i um, actually didn't know that and maybe that's yes. why they maybe that's why they decided to change up the character designs in episodes two and three or two yeah yeah, yeah. So it, it was especially it was a, yeah the characters difficult. look so different from the characters the faces are so different Oh my god! There's yeah, a, yeah. in yeah. episode two, yeah, there's a different uh, character artist for two than there was for the original game. Mm. Right? There was, yeah. I don't know who was credited because I think the I think the I credits. Hold on, let me see okay. if I can find it. I know, I know who it was for episode three. I don't know for two. Uh, okay. Character designer Tanaka Kuni Kunihiko was the 
when you one. was for that was episode one, yeah. And the Xeno Gears guy, right? Yes, yes, yes. And he was replaced. I don't have the name of the person who replaced. Him. Yeah, I, I think from what I remember from when I did the videos, I, I the the way they were credited was weird. There was like four different people credited, so I don't know yeah. who specifically the designs were. And then with episode three, they changed them again, but they looked a bit more. I, I think the designs are better in episode three than they were in episode two. I, I agree. And, and I, I'm not really a big fan of the first game's look for the characters either, but mm-hmm. twos are really on like weird and unsettling and just emotionless yeah. to me. Yeah. They look like weird dolls. Yeah. And especially, yeah, there's, I think I remember in my video, I, I pulled up some like still shots of the characters and like, yeah, I, it, it looks it did just look weird. And they, I, I think yeah. you're right. by episode three, I feel like they nail kind of what one was going for, but it actually like mm, yeah. lights and works really well. And they've got yeah. like, a better handle on the tech. By the point. Yeah, I agree. I, I do like the, the designs in, in one. Um, but I I mean, looking from a more objective standpoint, I think that three is probably the best that the characters looked. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah, that that is a big element of like why yeah. one struggled as much as it did, and they only got that twenty percent of the full scene, as you said. Is they couldn't yep. even start really making the game until six I know. months before the game. Until was come out. yeah, yeah, <laughs> that's um, rough that, for anybody. It, yeah, crazy. for real. So the last note that I have here is about the music. Uh, Yasunori Mitsuda. Ah, yes, uh, the music. Yes, he did. My One of composer. our favorite composers. Yeah, mm-hmm. very very good. Um, Yep. People who listen to our podcast will be very familiar with Yasunori Mitsuda, not just because of the games that we cover, but also because of the intro and outro themes. Yes, I'm glad play. you're bringing this up. I'm so yes. glad. Oh, right. A lot yeah, of people yeah. ask us about this. A lot of people say, have, what's that song that plays I at the end? It sounds familiar. This. I've had to answer this probably like 50 times. I should probably just <laughs> yeah. lead off a podcast one of these days. Okay, I'm going to answer the question about this freaking song. <laughs> <laughs> So this song was written specifically for our well, podcast. Okay, let me clarify that real quick. Or wait, it's not it's for that's us. Not, that's not quite true. Um, okay, let's so, hear. Let's so hear the whole here's thing. Here's the story of how Yasunori Mitsuda wrote the music for our podcast. <laughs> okay, okay. Uh, <laughs> we have a, a viewer and a friend of mine. He goes by Heon online. He was working on a project in a freelance role that Yasunori Mitsuda was also working on. Um, and so he got to know him a little bit. And over a coffee break at the end of the project, he asked if he would write a little tune for him as a keepsake or as a, you know, sort of like a memento for having worked on the project with him, so to speak. Right. And okay. this was the tune that Mitsuda came up with over that 15 minute coffee break. Then he on donated the track to us to use in whatever capacity we saw fit. I held on to that MIDI for kind of a little bit of time. I didn't have time because we were sort of like getting the channels getting off the sort of off the ground when we first started working on it regularly. Um, we were doing a stream once a week. We were creating a video once a week. We we're doing a podcast once a week. It was a lot of work. So I just didn't have the the bandwidth at the time to really do anything with the, that MIDI file because that's all it was was a MIDI file. Okay. And yeah. eventually I sat down with my actual like composing tools and, and libraries and stuff like that. And I tried to more or less follow very closely what the instrument choice uh, that had been labeled by Mitsuda in that original MIDI, I tried to follow almost exactly what he had written. And that's what you hear in the intro of our podcast, the music that starts right at the very beginning. Mm -hmm. The music at the end, which is what everybody asks about and what everybody wants to know more about, was um, a take on that piece by one of our viewers named Symphonikev. He has a... That's right, that's right. He has a YouTube channel, Symphonikev, it's spelled oh with an God. S, S Y M K O N I V, Symphonikev. No, oh, okay. I, I, sorry, I spell, I'll put it in the description. <laughs> put it, yeah. Symphonikev, Link in the description, Symphonikev, yeah. Symphonikev, E V yes. at the end, is his name. <laughs> yeah. Um, anyways, he wanted to kind of mix it up a little bit, particularly with the bass, to give it more of a chrono trigger sound. So that's the, mm. the big difference in feel is it's got a percussion and, and a beat and a and a bass line that sounds very Chrono Trigger esque, and yeah. um, and it really meshed well with with the melody too. It really sounded like something that might come out of a Chrono game. So 
Um, that's where that song comes from. Uh, and okay. it, was, it was, I was thrilled to receive it because, like I, like I was saying, Mitsuda is my favorite game composer of all time. Yes. And, mm -hmm. um, but but I, I got in, not in trouble, but uh, I, I had to eat my tongue a little bit because I thought the same thing that Kaysen had said. I thought he had written it specifically for our podcast. And I okay. went on Twitter when I originally did my version of the piece and I released it. I was like, Yasuno Mitsuda, and I tagged him. Yasuno Mitsuda wrote this piece directly for us. <laughs> and and Hyun was like, uh, no, that's not exactly right <laughs> and i was like oh okay so anyway that's the story behind how we got that yeah well great so yes and the road meets it i did uh xenosaga here and there was a bit of a it was a it was worrisome it was it was possible that mitsuda was not going to be able to work on this game um and oh. but uh takashi takahashi tezuka no Tetsuya Takahashi. Tetsuya Takahashi. Yeah. Um, that he really wanted Mitsuda because Mitsuda did Xenogears, right? Mm -hmm. And um, said, I really want this, um, you know, this musician. But uh, Mitsuda had other projects and apparently had just like flown back to Japan from an airplane from like somewhere else where he had been doing music. And it just so happened that coincidentally was able to actually work on Xenosaga. It was not supposed to be. Wow. It was it was a, a luck luck had it that I actually noted me that I was able to work on this game again. I actually didn't know that. That's incredible. Yeah, yeah, yeah very cool. Very very good yeah. chance though. Very good chance meeting between well, them. And, and again, I'm going to point you to TJ's videos because he goes over the music differences between one and two and three. Mm. And, uh, there's really interesting parts there because it's like Mitsuda leaves after episode one. You get two composers on episode two. One of oh, them yeah. was just not suited for this game at all. No, no, <laughs> darn. not at all. Darn. The other composer goes on to do three and just yeah. lights out at that. Point. Yeah, just nails it. Yeah, what yeah. an incredible piece of work. The soundtrack for three. Yeah, um, and the music. It was using less like repeating sounds right that uh, uh mitsuda was able to actually like score cutscenes and and yeah. give tracks that were that weren't yeah. just loop yeah that's the yeah the interesting thing is like he approached this like very much like he like the songs that he composed for the games like he composed them like with specific scenes in mind mm. so it's tracks in the game for the most part there are a couple exceptions to this but tracks in episode one don't tend to repeat they're played like once for like this specific scene and that's basically it well if you go back to some of the things mitsuda has said about the the choice of music for xeno gears you can kind of see maybe where he tried to take some more ownership of that because there was certain like um like flight i think right that the very oh right right flight was not supposed to be used for the scene where where uh uh freaking choo choo blows yeah. out to fight against <laughs> that that gear <laughs> yeah <laughs> Right. Yeah. <laughs> that whole scene, yeah. right? That yeah, whole there's thing. A, there's that, a couple other ones. Yeah. Flight was not yeah. supposed to be used there. And so he kind of mm. talks about how he he was really disappointed in some of the choices of how music was used in Xeno Gears. Mm -hmm. So um that that's interesting. But it's also interesting that Tetsuya Takahashi went on to be the director of the music. Or what was it? Director? Yeah. Was it was like a, it was music like music coordinator i think uh is, yeah music coordinator. Don't, music coordinator yeah. yeah and i don't know what that means entails that? yeah, yeah. Mm. i mean it could mean anything but like uh, you know aside from like he was somehow involved in the music somehow but i don't know i mean all i know is he was involved somehow in the soundtrack for episode three is way better <laughs> incredible so okay there you go whatever whatever he did <laughs> it worked so right. yeah nice. um so yeah, do we get That's what all, I got. all of your notes there? Anything else you want to add, TJ, to development history of Xenosaga that we? Oh can man, I don't think so. I think we nailed all the all the big points. Yeah. If we forgot anything, I can't think of. You know, we we hit the we hit the major ones that I wanted to that I wanted to hit. So okay, so that's where we're going to leave off for this week. Um, next week we'll jump straight into the opening scene. Um, Kaysen, you had kind of because this is hard. This is uncharted territory for me, so it's hard for me to pick like where yeah. we should stop. <laughs> Oh Casey yeah, has a good stopping point that you had come oh, up with. I think it was <laughs> well, no, after the okay. Gnosis attack, right? It was, but here's the thing: this was for two episodes. Oh yeah, so that's true. That's in true. two episodes. We're gonna you should stop playing as soon as the character Ziggurat Eight Ziggy shows Ziggy, up. Yeah. 
Okay. And you see, you are introduced to Ziggy. That's where you stop playing for episode three of this podcast. I don't know where to stop playing for episode <laughs> yeah. two. I think the Gnosis attack, the start well, of the Gnosis attack. just before the Gnosis attack, okay. but I'm trying to think. Or, yeah, I'm trying to think I, if there's like I, a save, if there's like an opportunity. Because we're going to be going through a ton of stuff just in the first few cutscenes. It's going to take up a whole episode. Um, yeah. And just to just to get the setting for the world. And yeah, and there's and a there's lot. So that, much yeah, there. yeah, I think like right before the Gnosis attack is is probably a, as good a place as any. But how do people know before? Anyways, I don't. Uh, know. <laughs> there's like, yeah, I don't know. Like when like when Shion's about to go to sleep in a room, I think is when that happens. I don't know. Okay, so I don't. This is going to be. I'm looking through my notes. But, but why don't we just say that? Just try because that's about five hours ish. Would you say? Yes, yeah, it's and and we'll turn it into two episodes. Yeah, yeah. So get to the point where you meet Ziggy, save as soon as you can, and mm-hmm. that's going to be episode three. And then just just play up to that, and then you'll be good for two weeks. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, we appreciate you uh, joining us, TJ. Really, really, yeah. Really, again, recommend that people go watch your channel. It's 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 criminal that the views are as low as they are for the 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 quality of the work you put out on. So, well, thank you, again. everybody. Go. To, it's going to be in the description. Yeah, and in the pinned yeah. comment, like yeah. go watch those videos. They're yeah. great, and hopefully and we can have you on again uh, as many times as yeah. you'd like to come on. Actually, yeah, I'd love to come on again. I mean, talking for a couple hours on Xenosaga, like, <laughs> yeah, yeah, dude. <laughs> <laughs> That'd be great uh, because I, I do like to have at least one person along who has actually played the game and who can sort of yeah. correct things for us. <laughs> if, yeah, if we're not understanding or for it on totally the wrong foot with something, you know. Right. Okay. Uh, anyway, appreciate you. Thanks everybody for watching, and we'll see you again next week. All right. Peace out. See ya. Bye.